What is the gospel? Find out today as we come together and worship God. Welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We hope and pray that you will be blessed as we gather together by faith under Christ and worship God. We're not able to meet at the moment in the building here, but by faith we will join with one another by the power of the Holy Spirit and hear from his words, sing his praises, pray to him and worship him. God is good. Listen to the words of Psalm 105, this glorious invitation to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. These are glorious words. And what else can we do but stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene? So will you sing with me?
shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love Will you pray with me? Our Lord, our God, we give you thanks and praise. We call upon your name because you are good. We thank you and praise you, O Lord, that we know your name. You are Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We are united to you. We are redeemed and rescued by your great love and we worship you. We call upon your name, dear Lord. What else can we do? We cannot meet in this building, but we can meet by faith in the very throne room of heaven. We join us, O oh Lord. Join us through space and time. Join us, dear Lord, to Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. We want to make your deeds known among the peoples. We want to sing to you. We want to sing your praises and tell of all your wondrous works. We want to glory in your name and let our hearts rejoice because we seek you, O Lord. We seek your strength. We seek your presence continually and we need your grace. Send down your Holy Spirit. Unite us to Christ so that we can remember the wondrous works that he did, his miracles and the judgments that he uttered. For he is our Lord, our Saviour, our God. Oh, Lord Jesus, receive our praise, our worship and our prayers. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, will you sing with me, Come, O Fount of Every Blessing. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging love Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy grace now like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to Thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it Seal it for Thy courts above can seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come to you again and we're thrilled that you are this glorious God, our wonderful Redeemer. And we praise you and worship you, O oh Lord. But Lord, we need your grace. We need your mercy. We need that reassurance that you have loved us with an everlasting love because we come to you again, dear Lord, having sinned. We are bowed down with the weight of sin. We have regrets, dear Lord, regrets from many years ago and regrets from earlier this week. We've sinned against you in the things that we ought not to have done. We've sinned against you in failing to do the good things that we ought to have done and we need mercy. We need grace. We need reassurance of your love and your forgiveness. We need you, dear Lord, to come and rescue us. So bless us and help us, dear Lord. Show us Jesus. 
Lord, we need redemption in our lives as well. Lord, so many of us are struggling with ill health and we need your grace. Some of us are struggling with pain and we need mercy. Some of us are worried about friends and families and Lord, please have mercy on them. Oh, dear Lord, please hear our prayers for them. We pray for our nation. And again, dear Lord, we look at the mess that our nation has made of your blessings. And Lord, we need mercy as a nation. Please, in the midst of this uh, coronavirus epidemic, dear Lord, please turn people's hearts back to you. Let the people know that you are God. Lord, we have nothing to unite us as a nation anymore because we've turned away from Christ. We've believed all sorts of different lies. And Lord, nothing can give us the unity that we desperately need unless we come together as a church, unless we come together as the people of God, unless the gospel goes out and revives this nation again. So please, dear Lord, forgive our sins. Have mercy on us individually, corporately, as a nation and as a world. Have mercy on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the great blessings that we have is the reassurance of God's love and forgiveness. God again and again says, I forgive you. We celebrate that in the words of Psalm 103. We've got this song version. I wrote the tune for it a while ago. Peter's playing, Val singing. It's a wonderful, wonderful words as we remind ourselves that as far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our sins from himself. makes us as a church so excited about the gospel? What is it that should make you and me as individuals so thrilled at what God has done for us? Why do we come to God week after week to sing his praises? 
because of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And this week, we're going to be looking at just a brief, short summary of all the wonder that is the good news that we have. For the last few weeks, we've been studying the second letter of Paul's as he wrote to the Corinthian church for the second time. We've been looking at chapter 5, and last week we studied this one verse. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And then Paul goes on to explain more about this new creation. Where did it come from and what should it, difference should it make in our lives? He says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Isn't that wonderful news? Oh, that brief summary. And I want us to think about three things this morning. I want us to think about the cost of our reconciliation, the blessings of our reconciliation, and the responsibility of our reconciliation. But what is reconciliation? One of the hard tasks that I have, it's a, a wonderful reward, it's a blessing, especially when it makes a difference, but it's never easy. It's listening to somebody who has fallen out with their uh, spouse or their relative or their child or their mother or their father or their brother, or their sister, their neighbours. And you weep with those who weep. You encourage them, you bless them, you pray with them, you give them counsel, you listen to all of their heartache and all of their troubles. But you know what it's like to have fallen out with somebody, I'm sure. There's been that time when you've had that close, intimate relationship with somebody that you invested so much in emotionally. And there was that time when everything was good. That time when you got on well together, and you felt loved and accepted, when you could open up to this person, and then suddenly there was the betrayal. That moment where the husband, the wife, the child, the daughter, the sister, the brother, the mother, the father, the neighbor, the colleague at work, that good relationship was destroyed. And maybe, yeah, maybe it's partly your fault. But often it's through just an intransigent, something that goes wrong in the heart of the other person. Obviously, as I try and give pastoral advice and open up the word of God to people, forgiveness has to be our first and foremost response to somebody that is seeking to reconcile with that broken relationship. But there's other times where it becomes impossible for us. There's other times when we have to go back to Romans chapter 12. As far as it is possible with you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes it's just not possible. The person has walked away. They never want to see you again. They never want to speak to you again. And it is heartbreaking. And how much more heartbreaking would it be for an infinite God of infinite love as he looks down on his image bearers, you and I, made in the image of God? And we're out of fellowship with him. We're out of sync with him. We have betrayed him. We have hurt him. This is the tragic story of all of humanity. This is the tragic story of all of the Bible. We see all of these men of God throughout the whole of the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, Men and women of God seeking to be faithful to him and letting him down again and again and again. And if you've ever been let down, you know how heartbreaking and how tough that can be. Of course, it would be nice if we could just sort of say, shrug it off and say, it's not really that much of a big deal. But in all honesty, if you've got that attitude, if you can just shrug it off, well, either you never really love the person that much. Or you, uh, there's something wrong within you, or you're a liar. You're suppressing the truth. The fact is, the deeper the love, the costlier it is to make reconciliation. And so there's times when I sit 
and I try and give advice about how to reconcile. And sometimes it's, I encourage uh, the person, go to, uh, go to your friend, go to your wife, go to, and talk to them. Try and open up, say, make apologies and hope that it comes back again. Sometimes you have to write a letter. Sometimes you need a, a, a neutral third party to come in. And I try and offer that as a role to people. I try to offer the opportunity for a husband and wife to reconcile with one another. So that role of reconciliation has to be at the very heart of our practical Christian life. Why? Because we are out of sync with God. You and I have destroyed by nature, we have destroyed everything that is good and wholesome and trustworthy in our relationship with God. And God is hurt. You might not be. If you're an unbeliever this morning, and if you're watching this, this video, and you're curious about what the Christian faith is, your heart is probably so hard and uh, so indifferent that you don't really care about the fact that you've upset it. And that, for me, is one of the most heartbreaking uh, things. I've counseled people who have uh, seen their husbands walk out on them, uh, their husbands have had uh, affairs, and the response of the husband is, eh, so what? It doesn't really bother me. And that grieves the wife so much more deeply. And how much more must that be true of God? The God of infinite love, the God who made you and me in his image. How much more should we be coming to God and saying, oh Lord, I've goofed up, I need to apologize, I need to make things right. The fact is, we can never make things right all by ourselves. The gap is too great, the hurt is too, uh, too much at the heart and character and soul of God. So we need somebody to intervene between us. Just like well, I have that uh, opp um, opportunity occasionally to sit with a husband and wife and to try and get them to speak to each other, to try and get them to apologize to one another. I act as that intermediary role. And it's a blessing when it happens. It's a true blessing when there's love and mercy and forgiveness when there's tears flow down and when the hugs and when the, uh, when the uh, relationship is made right again. This is what God can do. But how does God make things right between us, his image bearers, who have rebelled against him, whose hearts are hearts of stone, who feel completely indifferent about whether God exists or not or whether there's lots of other religions or not? How does that God make things right when we aren't seeking him. Our passage tells us, our passage tells us that the good news, the good news came from God. That God reconciled us through Christ to himself. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So when you think of the cost of our reconciliation, you must understand that it was God who took the initiative. And it was only God that could make things right with himself. God joined to him, himself a true human body. The eternal son of God, whom the angels loved and worshipped, volunteered to give up all of his privileges, all of his glory, all of his holiness, everything that made them filled with awe and adoration. All the outward trappings of majesty and glory and high, he put to one side. And he was conceived in the womb of his mother. He was born in a stable. He lived among, you, uh, among human beings. He lived that life limited with the ordinary limits of a human being. But you say, how could God do that? How could the creator God who made everything suddenly stop creating everything? Well, we have the Trinity. God the Father never compromised himself. God the Father remained e eternally seated on the throne. God the Father was in, in uh, control of the entire universe. God the Son uh, was in uh, Christ. 
God the Son was totally, completely, 100% united to the human body of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he took on all of those limitations for himself, and he never, ever used the power of God to sustain his human life. His human body had to be fed, just like you and I have to be fed. He had to eat. When he stubbed his toe, it hurt him just as much. Took on all the trials, all of the troubles, all of the heartaches, all of the tears that you and I had. And he did it with all the limitations that you and I had. The only difference that he had was that he'd never sinned. He never was out of fellowship with God. And the advantage that he had is that he knew that his, his father loved him and had a purpose for him and was willing to take him through all of the trials and tribulations that he had. Every now and again, you'll get a knock on the door. Or maybe you'll be down the far end of the high street and you'll see some people offering to you a Watchtower magazine or an Awake magazine. These are the Jehovah's Witnesses. And according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're lovely people. They know their Bibles. They take their faith very seriously. They sound very Christian, but they've departed from the truth that has united all Christian denominations. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That God had taken to himself a true human body, that the Lord Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man. So what is it that Jehovah's Witnesses believe? And the Christadelphians and the Arian sect of the second and third centuries and uh, all of these other sects and isms and cults and everything else that have gone before. Well, they don't like the idea that God is a trinity. They don't like the idea that Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. And so they try and rationalize it away. They try and explain it away. And a favorite thing that they often come back to is that, no, 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 no. Jesus was just an angel. Uh, as the son of God, he was the first created angel uh, and he wasn't eternal. There was a time when God the Father was all by his lonesome with nobody to love, nobody to talk to. And then uh, he got uh, uh, bored one day, I guess. And then he created a first angel and he said, this first angel is the one that I'm going to call my son. And so there was a time when the eternal son of God wasn't the eternal son of God. There was a time when just there was an angel in heaven that God gave extra, a little bit of extra privilege to. So why is it that that couldn't be true? Because our sin is too great, God is too holy. You see, the problem with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Christadelphians and the Arians and all of these other people, as they try and explain away that, is that they underestimate the holiness of God. And the justice of God. If God is infinite, eternal and unchangeable. If there are no limits to him. If he's unable to uh, forget anything for, because of his perfect knowledge of all things. Then our sin must be infinite, eternal and unchangeable. There will never be a time when such a holy God could ever forget about that sin. And every sin that we commit will grieve his heart for all eternity. How can we re repay that God? Well, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that hell is real. That eternity is long. That we will forever be separated from him. So long as we continue in rebellion against him, God must cast us, us, us out from his presence. Unless he takes the initiative, unless he makes reconciliation, unless he does something. And that's the problem. One angel, arguably, possibly, I don't know, possibly could act as a substitute for one human being. But is that you or is that me? What if God wants to reconcile the whole world to himself? People from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, from across the whole of the globe. 
What if God has chosen to save many, many millions, maybe even billions of people? What if God has chosen to do that? What is he going to do with these eternal consequences of the sin and the rebellion of so many million peoples? Can one angel, even if that angel is far greater and far more glorious than any human being, any individual, could one created angel act as an adequate substitute for all of those millions and billions of people? With all of their variety of sins, some great, some hideous, some monstrous, some trivial. What created angel could bear the full eternal consequence of that by himself? None. But the eternal son of God could. The eternal Son of God, who is in the bosom of the Father throughout all eternity, enjoying that love and that fellowship, volunteered to act as your substitute and as my substitute. He volunteered to go to that cross so that when he hung upon that cross, for hour after hour, he was able to swallow up the sins of the world, the sins of millions and billions of people, and the most horrific and the most trivial sins were all laid upon him, and he drew into himself and himself alone. And what it would have taken you and I an eternity in hell to pay the debt for, he was able to take upon his eternal soul. He was able to take that on himself in those few hours. No angel could do that. No human being could do that. Only the eternal Son of God. So when we think of the cost of our reconciliation, we should stand in awe and amazement that God should be willing to pay such a high cost, such a terrible penalty. No substitute, no goat, no sheep, no lamb, no dove, no, uh, no oxen, no cow, nothing in the temple of the time of Moses. Nothing like that could act as an adequate substitute. Certainly no angel, no human being could act as a substitute. Only the eternal son of God. And so we just stand humble, amazed. God should love us. That he should see beyond that sin that you and I had committed. That he should be willing to love with an everlasting love. That he should be willing to have mercy. And when we bring our sins into that light, suddenly our sins, which we can explain away, we think they're just small. They're not really that important. Suddenly, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they grow and grow and grow as they get bigger, as they get closer and closer to the holiness of God. And they no longer seem trivial. They grow in enormity. Because God is infinite. And yet the cost was paid in full. So we don't only have the cost of our reconciliation We have the blessing of our reconciliation. Because God was in Christ reconciling the world to uh, to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Isn't that good news? Isn't it wonderful to know that your sins have been fully dealt with? You remember that, uh, that old hymn, My sin not in part, But the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. That's the good news. You and I, though our sins may be as scarlet, God has made them as white as the driven snow. Though our sins may plague us, though they may bear us down, though the devil may drag up the past and remind us and condemn us again and again, our sins have been dealt with. They're covered in the blood of Christ. They have been nailed to the cross and God is satisfied. 
the reconciliation is over. God is able to see that justice has been done, his holiness has been honoured, his integrity has been magnified. He's enabled you and I to see the awfulness of sin, but he's enabled us to see a grace more glorious and more majestic than we could ever have possibly imagined. And that is what we have. We sang as far as east is from the west. So far God's love has borne away our many sins and trespasses. Those wonderful words from Psalm 103 should bring us comfort. They should bring us joy. And when Satan condemns ourselves, when we condemn ourselves, when we lie in bed thinking at night, oh, why did I do that? When we get up in the morning and think about coming to church, when we think about turning on uh, uh, and watching a sermon and we, they, that voice condemns us saying, how dare you, you hypocrite, how dare you come into the presence of a holy God? We can say, praise the Lord, I am free. Oh, the blessings of our reconciliation completely dealt with, gloriously transformed, and we are made right with God. And so that huge, infinite distance that stood between you and me, uh, between God and you and me, that infinite distance has been crossed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so long as you and I remain united to Christ, bought by his blood, loved with an everlasting love, chosen before the foundation of the world, so long as we are in the hand of God, we are safe and secure. And that's why we sing. That's why we rejoice. That's why we get so thrilled at the good news of the gospel. Our sins have been dealt with and hallelujah, we are free. So we have the cost of our reconciliation, the blessings of our reconciliation, but we also have the responsibility of our reconciliation. Having received such a glorious gift, we have to tell others. There's an amazing story in the Old Testament just during the time of uh, the um, northern kingdom of Israel. At this stage, the southern kingdom of Judah had broken away from the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel continued to rebel against God in all sorts of different ways and eventually God took his hand of protection and blessing away from them and the Assyrians came and invaded their capital city, Samaria. God did a miracle. God had mercy on them. God showed that he was powerful. And the whole of the Assyrian army died, fled. They were no more. And everybody who was starving inside that city had no idea of the mighty deliverance that had happened. The only people who knew were the lepers. The lepers were safe from the, uh, from the invading army because who wanted to kill a leper? They might catch, it, catch leprosy themselves. They went out one morning and there was the Assyrian camp, empty. And all of the food and all of the clothing and all of the livestock and everything else, all of the treasure that they had in their tents was left there outside the walls of, of Samaria. They started to eat. They were starving too. And suddenly they had this abundance of food far, far, far more than they could ever eat themselves. And having had their full, they said, who are we not to tell others? And they went to Samaria and they banged on the, uh, on the city wall doors. And they said, come out, come out. And they said, no, 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 rubbish, rubbish. We're worried, we're fearful. And then eventually they gained the courage to come out. And that whole city that was starving to death suddenly found all of their provision provided for by God. God intervened. And you and I are like those lepers. Our leprosy has been taken away and we have been healed. The very thing that made us untouchable by God has been dealt with by the cross. And suddenly we have found a feast beyond compare. And who are, who are you and I to be so selfish to keep it for ourselves when there's such an abundance of grace and mercy in Jesus Christ? And so we go banging on the doors of the city and we ignore their mocks and their jeers. We say, no, 
No, we have to hear this good news because there's abundance of goodness. People today look away from Jesus. People today think that Jesus is irrelevant. It's a relic of the past. It's just a myth, a fable that our grandparents once believed. It uh, gave us a few nice buildings, some, some nice art perhaps, some pretty music, but it's not relevant to us today. And yet, you look around and you look at the number of psychological problems. You look at the loneliness and the guilt and the shame that burdens down people. You read the astrology page and you read the agony ant pages in the newspapers and you read all of these other false substitutes which try and reassure people. Oh, don't worry about it. Let me explain it away. It's not really your fault. Don't feel so bad about yourself. Don't beat yourself up. And it doesn't work. But what does work is that certainty that God has dealt with your sin. If you're not a Christian yet, if this is the message that you've heard for the first time, you need to turn away from all of those false substitutes because they'll never make you happy. You need to come to Jesus. You need to lay down your guilt, your shame, your burdens, and everything that makes you feel fault, small and a failure, everything that you beat yourself up about, you lay it at the foot of the cross. And you receive that reconciliation between you and God. You come to him and you say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you have loved me. Thank you that you died on that cross for me. Thank you, dear Lord, that I receive this glorious gift that I don't deserve. I receive it by faith because I can offer to you nothing other. I put aside my own good works because they're never good enough. I put aside my sin at the cross and I leave it for you. And I just come as I am to receive that glorious gift. That's what you need to do if you're not yet a Christian. But if you are a Christian... Stop beating yourself up. Stop feeling like a miserable failure. Stop feeling, looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking, oh, how could I do that? Instead, look up. Look to Jesus. Look knowing that you will receive your grace and mercy and forgiveness there. Look taking awe and astonishment that that tremendous cost was fully paid. Look to the blessings that you have in your reconciliation. But then finally, remember that responsibility that you have. That responsibility to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. You can point people to this, uh, to this video. You can point people to our church website. You can point people to lots of other websites. You can chat about what Jesus has done in your life can pray for people you can give them christian literature a book a tract a booklet but people need to know this second thing that we can do is pray for our missionaries i was uh, um, heard about tim spring and uh, tim spring uh, works for the london city mission we support him as a church and he works among the Turkish community. He's a fluent Turkish speaker. And the ordinary way that he would meet with Muslims uh, who had never heard the good news of Jesus Christ for themselves, the way he'd ordinarily do it would be to go to a Tur Turkish cafe uh, or a Turkish uh, uh, community centre. And there he would engage people. But with the COVID-19 lockdown, he's unable to do that at the moment. And this is true of hundreds of thousands of other missionaries across the world. The ordinary way where they would go out and meet people, strangers, face to face, and open up those conversations and build those friendships so that other people can know Jesus. They're not able to do that at the moment. Prayer is needed for our missionaries. We have technology. We're grateful for the technology. But ultimately... There's no real substitute for having a good, deep relationship with another person. A deep sense of friendship and love and trust, support and help opens up hearts like nothing else will. So pray that God will deliver us from this plague. Pray that God will have mercy on this famine, uh, gospel famine nation of ours. 
The people would start to hunger and thirst again for the reality that there is in Jesus Christ. And as God enables you, look for those opportunities where God allows you to speak of your faith, your need for Jesus, the difference that Jesus has made in your heart and your life. Take up this responsibility, but take it up with joy in your heart, knowing that the cost has been paid in full. We're going to conclude our worship now as we sing this final song, O oh, Teach Me What It Meaneth. say the grace together and as you do so try to call to mind all of your brothers and sisters in Christ that you would ordinarily be sat with include them in your thoughts and prayers the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore amen hope and pray that this was a blessing to you like it share it uh, make some comments. All of these things help promote it on the sidebar. Other people are able to watch. Put it up on your social media, on Facebook. Share it. Share the links in emails or however it is so that other people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ.
And until next week, may God richly bless you. Amen.